Welcome to Psych Sessions on Teaching and Learning Centers. My name is Chris Hakala, and I'm your podcast host. In this series of conversations, we speak with folks who have made the leap from a traditional faculty member position to a role in a center for teaching and learning. The conversations focus on how individuals moved from faculty to a center and how that move impacted their work, their career trajectory, and their personal and professional identity. Along the way, we talk about tips, advice, and challenges that come from working in a center. Sit back and enjoy these chats on Psych Sessions on Teaching and Learning Centers. Leslie, thanks for, for talking to me today. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's good to, to, to have this conversation. I mean, you and I uh, met just a few years ago, um, and uh, it's been great getting to know you and to hearing about all the things that you've been doing. So um, I'd like to start with just a little bit of, if you can tell me a little bit about your background, where you came from, and how you sort of ended up in this world. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm so excited to be able to be with you today and have this conversation. So I, my doctorate is in ed psych, and I went to Northern Arizona University in the early 2000s. And NAU was kind of progressive in terms of its online teaching and learning, serving the Navajo Nation. So I realized the other day that I had actually taught a high flex class in 2006, just because we were using like the predecessor to Zoom, like the television, um, they would Zoom on the person that was talking. Have you heard of? of oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, little, the little camera turns and faces. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's, it's a little creepy when you're in there, but it's very effective. It, and I, I remember when Zoom first came out, I had the same thought. I said, now we don't have that camera coming at you. Right, right. Well, and I had one person who was live in person with me in the room. And then a bunch of students that were at Tuba City and, and um, Window Rock. But, you know, I, I was at NAU in the early 2000s. And part of my doc program was actually a, a teaching assistantship that was for credit. They had a pretty active teaching and learning um, center. And I graduated. I went on to a really small university in Southern Colorado. But before we get to the small university, yeah. I, I want to back up because I think you said okay. interesting. So you had an assistantship in the teaching center. I did, I had an assistantship as part of my program of study. Okay. So what what sorts of things did that involve? What were you doing in that uh, assistantship? I was sitting in the class that my um, super, supervisor was teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with her on, it was a one-on-one -on -one assistantship, right? So I was um, working with her on lesson planning, helping out with the grading, but it was very interactive. It was a lot of scaffolded support. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it was um, kind of like a, like a graduate level supplemental instructor sort of thing. But of course, you know, uh, so that I was there to interact with the students. I was there to okay. help her with the classroom management. And I was also there to learn how to write a syllabus, how to write an effective assessment, how to um, create an en engaging course. So, and who was the, the faculty member? And uh, I'll, I'll ask that first. Who was the faculty member? This was um, Rebecca Campbell. She's now at the University of um, uh, UNM in ooh, South Las Cruces. She's, she's just oh. become like an, I can't remember her title, but she's like an associate dean level. Okay. So she and was my, uh, my supervisor and my mentor for teaching and learning. And she also had a whole group of graduate students, myself among them, that taught this entry level um, ed psych course that was okay. basically part of the first year seminar course. It was the learning to learn course. So we were teaching mm -hmm. students about short term memory and how to leverage that into studying and effective study strategies and time management and all of mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, that, and that's so interesting to get when you're in graduate school, because for most of us, we end up in graduate school because we were really good undergraduates or we were at least interested in undergraduates. Yeah. And some of these things that we teach our students who struggle are things that we might have done, we might have stumbled upon, but to see them be articulated in such a clear and intentional fashion and then to be able to pick that up and apply it makes a lot of sense. Now, of course, you were in an ed psych program, so that's, there's a lot of that overlap right. anyway. But the reality right. is we still have many faculty coming out of graduate school who really have not thought about the fact that the approach that they take to teaching and learning, or learning in particular, is not an approach shared by all students. And, and 
one of the things that really helps students is to be aware of those things. So it was great that you were able to go through that experience and have that almost one-on-one mentorship with, with your advisor on teaching and learning, because not everybody gets that. Um, and it, I think it carries into uh, what we want to do later in our careers too. So Exactly. And, and I mean, so many faculty, even those who've been teaching for years are, are not familiar with things like metacognition, like self-regulated yeah. learning like the the limits of working memory and and rehearsal strategies and all of those Mm -hmm. sorts of things that are sort of part of your program, Mm -hmm. or at least those of us that teach intro psych are are very conversant in how these things work and hopefully in a way that translates it for our students so that they can use it to their benefit as as learners. Well, and you've been to POD. And one of the things that always opens my eyes at POD is when they talk about these things that are part and parcel of the psychology graduate experience. Exactly. By knowing psychology. And they present it as, as, as new information for these people. And you think, why didn't they? Oh, they weren't in a psychology program. And it's no knock on these people. They're really good center directors. Absolutely. They have really good skills. But we just were lucky enough to get that as part of our, our program. Now, Eric's going to give me a hard time for saying lucky. I'll say fortunate. But, but the reality right. is... Um, we, it was, it was just part of what we went through as, as experience. So anyway, I interrupted. Exactly. Exactly. No, no, that's fine. Um, thank you for helping me slow down there. But so I, I got my doctorate at NAU and actually, so I was in the ed psych program, which was housed in the college of education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what our center was associated with. And I got to also engage with the the Center for Teaching and Learning, some of their program as a graduate Mm -hmm. student. And I actually taught for a year for the psych department, which was a completely separate department. So I was teaching three intro psych classes and a capstone course, and I got to teach research methods there. So I was really very, very fortunate at NAU in that I got the teaching assistantship. Mm -hmm. I got to learn what a center for teaching and learning did at Mm -hmm. least to to a small degree. Yeah. yeah. I got a lot of teaching experience just in person Mm -hmm. um, teaching experience. And I, I got a lot of um, online learning teaching experience during a time when not many schools were doing it. Mm -hmm. And that ended up just a personal side note ended up being really powerful for me because when I was working on my dissertation, my mother was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. And it was eight months from diagnosis to when she passed away. But I was able to go home. Mm-hmm. I was able to work on my dissertation. I took some online classes. I taught yeah. an online class mm-hmm. as a GA ship. And I was able to be there with my mom and keep up and, and ultimately graduated on time. So, you yeah. know, I kind of got a, a really well-rounded um, graduate experience in terms of what we're dealing with now, right? Face-to-face yeah. and online learning and everything in between. Yeah, I think you, you bring up a really, uh, I think, important point about the idea of how online and remote instruction can provide another layer of support for people in this profession in ways that, that I think we haven't really thought about much until the past couple of years. And what you said about your your um, your mom being able to do that to be able to go home and by the way where is home Texas Central right. Texas okay yeah. to be able to return to Central Texas while you're still working on your dissertation is something that even um, you know uh, 30 years ago would have been much more challenging and so it's really important for us as we see these these advances and and we've learned from the early or correspondence education through um, early. LMS is, by the way, I'm old enough yes. to remember when, when Blackboard was a new thing and there's right. something called WebCT. WebCT, when, absolutely. Yeah, Blackboard and WebCT. Um, and, and when those things were new and, and, and we can leverage these things in ways that I think really provide uh, an opportunity for us to do things we hadn't considered before. So I think that's really um, uh, terrific. And I'm, you know, on a personal note, I'm sorry about your mom. Um, many of us in this uh, world that, you know, we've at our, well, my age anyway, been through this and it's, it's, yeah, it's not easy. So, yeah. um, I do know about that. And I do think one of the other interesting things, and the reason I, I, I sort of go back to that is there is more and more recognition among academia that, um, we make choices based on all kinds of variables when we choose career options, et cetera. Um, and our personal lives are becoming, um, I think we're, we're placing them in a more prominent position than Absolutely. people did in the past. Uh, I think Absolutely. it's a really positive thing for the for the field. Um, 
uh, it, you know, uh, there, we were mentioning before we started recording a colleague who, uh, uh, Bethany Fleck, who writes about mommy guilt and mm-hmm. some of the issues she's dealt with, um, with trying to deal with, with mommy guilt. And I think that there's, there's, there's a lot of pressures we get. And I think um, having some of these options allow us to, to be able to juggle more things in, in a positive way. Um, Absolutely. So anyway, to my own personal rant right there, but I feel very strongly about it um, because I think that uh, uh, academia as a career um, is a wonderful career for doing lots of really interesting things, um, mm-hmm. including raise a family or, or travel or whatever it is people choose to do. Um, and it still allows us to be very effective and, and, and impactful in our careers. Um, so, uh, and, and, and it doesn't tie us down as much as before. So anyway, so, uh, you ended up going <laughs> from China, lots of stuff to talk about, Leslie, lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, yes, exactly. And, and, you know, there's, there's no reason we can't talk about these issues about, uh, our, our lives anymore, but I will say, uh, and I'll make one more comment. It wasn't talked about when I started grad school. No, no. And, and for better or for worse, we're talking more about it now with the pandemic, because in some ways, the demands on faculty life were unsustainable before the, the pandemic. And of course, you know very well um, all of the ways that that has changed, the, the what faculty have had to go through to adapt, the ways that women have been um, disproportionately affected. Yep. I think we're having some really interesting conversations these days about, about what the, the future academic workplace needs to look like. So I hope for, I hope, uh, all to the good eventually. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So that was a okay. big turn, but now <laughs> you end up at a, a small so, college in Colorado, right? I did. I ended up at Adams State University, which is a uh, regional state institution. It's very geographically isolated. Um, it's in a town of about 10,000. Mm-hmm. And depending upon whether you count um, all of the online graduate students, the enrollment is somewhere under 2000. It's Colorado's oldest, so the first federally designated um, Hispanic serving institution, mm-hmm. meaning that we have greater than 25% of the enrollment being Hispanic students and also mm-hmm. a particular percentage of students receiving need based aid. Okay. So that's where I was from 2006 until 2019. So and were you in the psych department? Years. I was in the psych department. I was hired as um, an assistant professor of psychology. It was a department of six, so mm-hmm. very small psych department. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, the exciting thing about that is even though I was an um, educational psychologist, we were all kind of generalists, right? Mm-hmm. So um, it was really hard to keep a clinical person in um, such a rural, isolated area. So um, I, I taught... Um, child and adolescent psychopathology. Uh I do have some background in mental health, but, you know, taught it from a a developmental perspective, Mm -hmm. but we got to do a lot of cool stuff. There, there wasn't a psych high chapter when I arrived. So within my first year, I chartered um, a psych high chapter there, which set me on a path for being involved with psych high, which has been a really wonderful opportunity for me as a faculty member. Uh-huh. But it was it, it was this really cool little school that was originally a normal school. So it was mm-hmm. the, the regional teachers college. Yeah, it's interesting that what you're describing in the small department, that's so common. And uh, if you ever want to feel accomplished, maybe not, I don't know, count the number of different preps you've done in the course of your career. And you realize at a small school, so I was at a school, of, we had five faculty at one point, and then I was at a school yeah. with seven. And I was teaching industrial organizational psychology, and I'm a cognitive psychologist, I can kind of see that. I taught developmental, I taught aging, I taught the psychology mm-hmm. of women once for a semester, <laughs> for someone on sabbatical. And, and it, you really does, it stretches your, your perspective and it teaches you how to think about things from different points of view, all the things we ask our students to do. Um, and I think it's wonderful when we do that. Um, and it's always interesting to me to talk to someone at a big institution who says, yeah, I teach statistics and advanced cognition. And mm-hmm. I think, well, what else do you teach? No, that's what I teach. And that's how you, hyper-specialized you can get in bigger institutions right. versus smaller places. So um, right. teaching child psychopathology must have been fun, actually. It was fun. It was one of my favorite classes, actually. And 
I guess the other thing about small schools is when there's not a graduate program, the undergrads really get the attention that grad students might. So having totally. undergraduate student researchers getting to do really cool things. I had six student co-authors on the reproducibility project, which is, you know, one of those like groundbreaking studies that is that will continue to um, have impact for many years to come. And mm-hmm. six undergraduate students at a tiny little regional university yep. are co-authors there. So. And that's fantastic. And the students, and as someone who went to a small, I, the college I went to, we had three full-time psychology faculty. Wow. Now, ironically, I still talk to two out of the three faculty on a fairly regular basis. When I say fairly regular, once a month or so. So wow. when I graduated 30, 31 years ago, I still talk to that's two out amazing. of the three faculty. Because it, that was the department and they were doing what you're saying. I mean, we were involved in things and they gave us the attention that graduate students would get. It was almost like having mentors before I had a faculty mentor as a graduate student. And I think small colleges do those kinds of things. It's why I've always been attracted to small colleges personally, Um, where Mm -hmm. I am now, we only have 2,500 students. So yeah, yeah, uh, that's incredible. And then your place where you are now, Denver is much bigger. It's much bigger. It has about 10,000 students. And one of the interesting things about DU is that it's about half and half between undergraduate and graduate students. Oh, okay. So, which is, seems to be fairly unusual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what brought you from uh, uh, Adams, Adams State, Adams State yeah. to your current position? Well, so about 2011, um, we had a faculty Senate meeting prior to the start of school where they were Our faculty senate was um, asking the faculty at Adams State, what do you, would you like us to take on? What are some of the issues that are important to you? And I had been kind of confused about why a college that focuses on teaching where about 60% of the retention and promotion criteria comes from teaching had no internal or very little internal teaching support, very little opportunity on campus for you to grow as a faculty member and grow as an educator. Mm -hmm. And everybody I spoke to believed that professional development meant getting money from the VPAA office to go to conferences. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you would get money from the office in addition to what the department could provide, you would come back. And then there was never really any expectation that you do anything with that knowledge. There was Uh really no expectation, even that it was a teaching related conference. And so we had very little internal teaching support. Now we had had title five grants Mm -hmm. and those are the, the federal grant that's available to Hispanic serving institutions. And they did a lot of kind of equity based teaching and learning work, but it was, you know, here and there, and, and it was it was based on soft money. Mm-hmm. So I proposed to faculty senate that we needed to have more internal professional development so that people could grow as teachers. Mm-hmm. And like any good school, um, it was small school. It's like, great, why don't you be on that committee? <laughs> so, yep. yep, you can see that so, coming. I was on that committee, and I was actually really um, lucky to be joined on that committee by a, a woman named um, Bees Shell, who's now at um, Colorado Mountain College. Mm-hmm. But she had started a faculty development center or a teaching and learning center at Fredonia. Oh, and Fredonia, she New York? A, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so she ended up at Adams State as the chair of our kinesiology department. Uh-huh. And she wanted to be on the committee too. And she had created this teaching and learning center. So she didn't want to do that again, mm-hmm. but she did want to be involved because she said, you know, I just did new faculty orientation and there was never an opportunity for us to even introduce ourselves to one another. Mm-hmm. It was a parade of talking heads, you know, people getting their 15 minutes of fame. You're never going to remember who that person is mm-hmm. when you need them, but everybody wants a piece of the new faculty. And that was what the new faculty orientation experience was. So about the first year of this committee, we learned about other schools and other teaching and learning centers and, and, you know, what schools our size had and didn't have. And then as that committee became more formalized, we started um, asking for things like, can we take over new faculty orientation? We just, we'd like to start there. This is a small manageable piece. 
And the VPAA said, yes, as long as you don't give it back. And so <laughs> we took over um, new faculty orientation. We, uh, this group became the faculty development committee. Uh-huh. And then we ended up starting to collaborate with our, the folks that were doing our Title V grant for some funding because Title V explicitly is meant to be for capacity building uh-huh. and professional development to help faculty and staff better serve diverse students. Mm-hmm. So between funding for the VPAA office and this burgeoning agreement and association with Title V, we, we started little by little doing more and more. So it started with new faculty orientation very soon after we had a, a winter retreat Little mm-hmm. by little, we started doing programming. And then I got invited to be on the grant writing team for the Title V grant that was for the 2015 to 2020 cycle. Mm-hmm. So we wrote into that grant the establishment of a formal, cent- form- formal center. Uh-huh. And it was the center, the, the grant writer named it. I was not, I, I would, she was like, what do you want to call it? I was like, I don't know. They have all of, you know. So it was our Center for Teaching, Innovation, and Research. And so I was the founding director of that until 2019. And um, that was when I had the wonderful opportunity to join DU. But I spent, you know, about nine years building, Mm -hmm. you know, the the momentum and then being involved on the grant team to, um, to institutionalize a teaching and learning center where there had not been one before. So that that's fascinating. And, and you know, all everybody has entered this in different ways. I've talked to several people, everybody comes at it from different ways. I think this is really interesting. When you became the center director, did you still teach uh, was still part of your role teaching and and then running the center of 50 50, 75 25? It it evolved over time. Um I proposed at one point I was I had applied for a sabbatical. Uh-huh. And then a small department, one of our faculty members left and it became clear that there was not going to be any way for us to, to staff all the classes because yeah, yeah. adjuncts are, are a hard thing to come by in rural Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. And so I proposed a part-time assignment as a, a, you know, doing the faculty development work as kind of an alternate sabbatical. Uh-huh. And I was told No. But over the summer, um, the administration decided to create a faculty fellow position Uh and I applied for it. And so I became a faculty fellow, which came with a two course reduction. We were teaching four fours. Yeah. So um, I had I first was a faculty fellow and then I was um, written into the grant to be the center director Uh um, when that grant was funded in 2015. And at that point, it sort of moved to a. 0.75 0.75 administrative, 0.25 mm-hmm. teaching. But again, it was it was hard to get rid of all the things related to teaching. And Chris, oh, yeah. I'm sure you know well, 50, 50 doesn't add up to 100 and neither nope. does 25, 75. So I was still, you know, um, the the psychi advisor. I was mm-hmm. still, you know, doing research with undergrads. I was, I was a faculty senator. I was, you know, I was doing all kinds of um service and and teaching related activities. Yeah. It's the curse of a small college. If you're remotely competent, you get to do a lot. Yes. Um, yes. And and you know it's funny that you so so the sabbatical thing is really interesting. I actually took a sabbatical to start a center at a different institution, but still taught both semesters even though I was on sabbatical and started oh, wow. one wow. course because of the same reason. We had someone leave and it just wasn't enough people to teach. And so I stepped up and was willing to do one course each semester just because I thought it was really important for our students to get that. And I think that that's a, that's a small college kind of attitude. And, and, and what you talked to, the students need us at small yes. colleges. And there's no redundancy built in. And so right. I think there are times where you just, you just step up and do it. Uh, right. And I think that that's, that's part of what makes, I think, uh, us as faculty, um, it, it makes the faculty profession different in that we are often willing to give more than we're asked to do because we understand the impact that it has. And I think that that's, that's where you were at Adams. Yeah. State. And so so yeah, I, think that, I think that's great. And, and so you were there as a director essentially for four years. And then this, this job came up at DU. Right. And actually it was kind of funny, Chris. So since we met at pod yeah. and that was 2018, 2018. In, mm-hmm. in Portland, 
Um, I went to the job fair at Pod just Did for you fun, really? and I was um, getting ready to go on sabbatical at that time. My I finally got a sabbatical thirteen years <laughs> later, right? At um, that was scheduled for spring of twenty nineteen. Uh huh. But I went to the to the job fair and all of that, and looked around and chatted with this woman from the University of Denver. Oh, that's funny. And um, at the time, they were looking for a director, and I was like, "Well, do you, does this person get to teach?" And they were like, "No." And I was like, oh, "Okay," but and I was, you know, not seriously on the market anyway. Yeah, yeah. And so I went off. I did my um, sabbatical. Summer of 2019 rolls around, and I had been just kind of sporadically looking on the Chronicle and higher ed jobs just mm-hmm. out of out of curiosity. And then the the DU, the director of the Office of Teaching and Learning, that job was reposted. And later on, I found out that the they, they had had a failed search, so they were researching uh, the position uh. that I learned about at Pod. And in fact, when I got on the first Zoom interview, the woman, one of the women that was on the committee, I was like, wait a minute, I did we meet uh-huh. at Pod? And sure enough, we had. And that's um, Kate Willing, who's our vice provost for faculty affairs, who's my supervisor now. Oh, so funny. the job waited for me. Uh, that, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's great. And then those kinds of things, I mean, it's it's academia. These the weird yeah. things happen, right? So I mean, that's great. So um, did you and your family moved? We moved. So okay. Denver's really only about four hours away from okay. Alamosa, which is where Adam State was. Uh-huh. And we frequently went to Denver. I mean, you had to, to get to the airport to, mm-hmm. to find more than two dishwasher options. If you needed new appliances. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we had to leave town even for dermatology appointments. There were, we were accustomed to leaving Alamosa for shopping or, or to go to, you know, the, the science museum and, and things like that. So it wasn't a huge stretch, but it was, yeah. it was a big change in terms of, you know, uh, just living in a bigger city and, and we had lived out in the country and now we live in a neighborhood. So yeah. On a, it, on a side a note, change. living, living in, uh, I live in Massachusetts and, and I've grown up in Massachusetts. Uh, what you're saying to me, four hours makes me two states away. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and and so lack of these things is never an issue for us. Right. We, I mean, we complain we have to drive to Boston, which is about 70 miles away. It's about an yeah. hour and 20 minutes. So it is interesting, the scale and scope. And I think that that's an interesting thing to think about, again, when we talk about professional career moves, because mm-hmm. um, depending on where you are in a country, some of these moves are different. I mean, I, I, I like to tell people I've had three jobs and never moved. Um, yeah, because yeah. I've been able to because the, there's enough schools around. I haven't had to, to right. relocate, and I think that that's uh, a different part of the country, and then not good or bad, just different. Right? And, uh, well, no, that's the West, and and it's yeah. funny because I've met several people who have grown up on the East Coast that have come out here because you know you think about all the the national parks and the deserts and all of yeah. these things, and and it's so different. Um, and that's but one example of like you can travel four hours and. You know, to to shop for a dishwasher, um, which is something completely um, foreign to people who have grown up on the on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, you move your family to Denver. You start the job, yeah. and you said yeah. you were positioned underneath the vice provost for faculty development for faculty affairs. Faculty affairs. Yes. Faculty affairs. Mm-hmm. And your title is director for the office of teaching and learning, and so you're responsible for. Um, all the programming and all of the support for faculty on teaching right. and learning. Um, right. How has that impacted your sort of professional identity? Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the changes that have happened and mm-hmm. you move from one institution to another, from one position to another? Right. Well, there's a couple of, thank you for that question, Chris, because there's a couple of really interesting layers because I moved from a state school to a private school, uh-huh. um, uh, from a small isolated school to a well-resourced, more urban school. And I shifted from faculty to staff. That mm-hmm. was the one reservation that I had in, in making this career shift was that, you know, there was no teaching mm-hmm. Um it's completely staff. It's 12 months, which I expected. And frankly, most of us work 12 months anyway. You yeah. know, I mean, that's mm-hmm. kind of 
the way things go, especially if you have a dual appointment, right? That's that's half and half between mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. center and as a faculty member. But I really I worried about being farther away from the classroom and um, not knowing as many students. And then, of course, you know, just for context, I, I started the job January 6th and then by March 17th, we were completely remote for the yeah. pandemic. So I was really only on campus for a couple of months before, mm-hmm. you know, we shifted to emergency mode. We are super fortunate at the Office of Teaching and Learning or the OTL, as we refer to it, in that I'm the director. My title is not executive director, which I think leads to some confusion because we also have um, four directors of specific areas of programming. And these are mm-hmm. all people with PhDs that focus on either academic assessment or inclusive pedagogy, scholarship of teaching and learning, and broadly our university teaching initiatives, which includes things like our course design institute and Mm -hmm. the uh, faculty student partnerships program. And we have another layer of faculty developers. And these are folks that are master's level, at least, that work on particular areas of programming like high impact practices and online learning. And then just since the pandemic, One of those faculty developers is supervising our instructional design team. So we have five instructional designers Uh because, and and we can maybe dig into this more later, you know, we had DU really specializes in high touch, face-to-face traditional learning environment. And so we had so few faculty that were using our learning management system Mm -hmm. that we we needed to have... um, a lot of support for folks making that transition. Yeah. So, so there's like 15 people in the office now. Wow. And wow. so while I oversee the programming, I'm a little bit further away from it because I'm the I'm a supervisor. I'm involved in the larger campus conversations and initiatives. I sat on a task force last year for the fall return to campus so that mm-hmm. I could be aware of what the faculty development programming um, would need to be. Um, But I work with my staff on, okay, we should really think about some programs related to this, whatever is the, um, you know, going on in the the larger university environment, but also the the larger higher ed environment. So just a small example, one of, I was working with one of the directors on, we need to really have um, a, a small institute this summer on, how to keep the things that you made and did during the pandemic, Uh uh right? To try to encourage people to continue to use Canvas to help them see that all those videos that they made were not for nothing, Mm -hmm. you know, and and how can they leverage that into something like more of a flip design and Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. making their courses more accessible and things like that. So I'm a little further away from the work. I, I do miss the facilitation work, but I also, it's hard for me to parse out how much of that is due to the pandemic uh-huh. And how much of that is due to the shift in the role. Yeah. So it is a bit of an identity shift of being a supervisor, being a faculty developer, not having a home department. You know, I'm not part mm-hmm. of the site department at DU. I, I know some of those folks, but I have no teaching load. I, I don't have colleagues um, that I work with um, closely in that department. And, and I've also had to think about things like, okay, professional development wise, Pod is going to be an easy sell, but yeah. will my top is my top something I can continue to attend, um, and I may have to pay out of pocket for those things that are that are less clearly related to my role as a center director. If that yeah. makes sense, no, it makes perfect sense, and I think it's really interesting. I mean, a lot of the things that you just talked about. First off, for a smaller institution, you said ten thousand is about five thousand grad, five thousand. Right, grad. right. You're, you're a big center for an institution of that size. Uh, Absolutely. Which, is, which is a credit to your administration and the people who had the foresight to want to put those kind of resources in place. Uh, the second is because it's not so big. And, and for, for context, I worked at Quinnipiac University for four years. Mm. And Quinnipiac's the same size, about 10,000 mm-hmm. students. But it was a little bit, it was about 6,500 undergrad, 3,500 grad, but, but similar. And we were an office of one. It was just me. Yeah. Yeah. And so you are yeah. really you're really well resourced in, in, in that kind of context. And, and I, think, I think that that really provides the faculty with lots of ways to make contact with the center and to, to benefit from, from those offerings. Um, with regard to the way that um, the institution's drawn that hard line with where you are, 
not in a faculty position at all, really does say to the to the to the faculty, listen, we're providing you with this this resource who is a professional mm-hmm. who understands mm-hmm. this, who can help carry that through. So I think that's all that's all terrific. Um, and I think that as you look at the professional organizations, I mean, Pod, as you said, is a natural fit, um, and it does become uh, more of a challenge. So NITOP, ACT are both conferences on teaching, but right, very specific right. to teaching of psychology. And so how do you justify right. that? Right. Um, I have an easier time because I still teach psychology courses. I can still justify it. Um, but I think that um, as you begin to, you know, get back onto campus, hopefully sooner rather than later, and we you begin to meet more people and get involved in, in these things, it'll really help sort of position you in a way that, you then have answers to those questions because mm-hmm. you know more about what the faculty want, what the administration wants you to do. It sounds like you have a good supervisor, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which, which helps a lot. Um, and yeah. as you, you know, you, you have hopefully some control over the people who work directly for you, the four directors, because that mm-hmm. helps if you've mm-hmm. got a hand in either hiring or you get along well yes. with them. Yes. Because, it, because really, I mean, they're doing the 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 on the ground work yeah. of, of yeah. what the center is doing. So, so it sounds like it, it really is a big shift for you going from a small institution or big institution, mostly teaching, and then doing you know fading in, yeah. and doing none of it. Um, uh, how do you feel about the transition from a perspective of uh, your um, your identity within mm-hmm. sort of how you see yourself? And and I only ask this because. For me, I still have this strong desire to be a part of my psychology community. Now, I moved, yeah. I moved out of it into a teaching center role um, after 20 plus years of being part of STP. So it was actually it was a, it was a hard transition. And I did actually take a couple of years where I really distanced myself from STP. I didn't mm-hmm. do a lot of mm-hmm. things. Um, but I've slowly been working my way back to try to be a part of both communities. I'm just sort of curious what you're right, about. right. Well, I guess one of the things I want to make sure that I say, and now might be a good time to do this, is I have such an incredible team. All of the folks who work in the OTL are just amazing, and it's been really interesting to see how how everybody transitioned to, you know, the the all hands on deck to yep. do the transition to, to remote learning yeah. and how that forced me to grow as a supervisor very quickly yep. and work with a team, getting to know them for two months in person and then doing all of this virtually yeah. you know, yeah. has been just an incredible experience. And actually that was one thing that I reflected on a lot. How would I be feeling as a, as a faculty member I am in a staff office. I have a team. We do weekly check-ins to kick off our meeting every week. I had a community Mm -hmm. of really amazing people when a lot of folks were very isolated because as you know, faculty work can be, is very autonomous and can Mm -hmm. be very isolating. Yep. Um, But then on the other hand, there is that, you know, difference in identity and Probably the biggest shift for me was <laughs> redefining what productivity looks like. Yeah. Because yeah, I would have these days of like, I felt like I did nothing. I was in meetings all day, but it was supporting my staff. It was mm-hmm. talking somebody off a, off a ledge. It was, you know, coming up with programming. It was helping with some messaging for the broader campus about how we can support them during the pandemic. You know, I really had to spend a lot of time recalibrating what um, productivity looked like because it's not check. I finished the syllabus. I've gotten through this stack of grading. I've moved this research project forward. You know, it was very different metrics of success. I I guess I will say one of the things that I feel grateful for as an educational psychologist is that there's still um, a lot of overlap in my role as a teaching and learning director Mm -hmm. and some of the work that I've been doing lately, um, in particular with with Nikki Jones, who's at Colorado Mesa, and looking at um, women's representation in the psychology curriculum 
because mm-hmm. even though it's very psychology focused, it's teaching and learning focused broadly. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can translate a lot of things. And even, you know, what you mentioned about ACT and about NITOP, mm-hmm. to me, there's a significant overlap because you're talking about what you can do to teach psychology effectively. A lot of those principles, rather than the specific content things, are definitely transferable to other disciplines. Yeah, I completely agree. And that's how I've sold it to my administration. I said, this is teaching and learning. It happens to be in a discipline, but this is teaching and learning at the top. And so I completely agree with you. And I think it's a really interesting perspective, what you said. I mean, having a good team makes a huge difference. But I think that as you uh, really begin to figure out um, how it's going to sort of go when you get back and get to know your teammates, your team members in in sort of a different context, Mm -hmm. I think that you do have this opportunity. And you said it before, to help people understand how can we take what we've learned and move forward with that. And that Mm -hmm. makes it kind of exciting. It Mm -hmm. does. I mean, the productivity thing. Yeah. I mean, during the height of the pandemic, I would spend nine hours a day on zoom. Yes. Yes. And and just be on zoom all day and, and, and feel like I got nothing done, but I know I did. I supported my colleagues. I did, but it didn't feel quite the same way. And I think that that, that's been a really different kind of calibration. And I did this for a few years before the pandemic. And I'd had days like that too, where I'd just be in meetings. And yeah, I think that it yeah. really is, it is a recalibration. So as you, as you think about this, are there any pieces of advice you'd want to sort of share with people who might want to move into this kind of role? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, Chris, one of the other pieces of this in my role at DU that I was lucky enough to get some experience in Um, at Adams State was, I truly believe in the power of a CTL as Mm -hmm. an advocate for change Mm -hmm. and for policy change, especially related to, you know, teaching and learning, obviously, but also I've had the opportunity at DU to um, be on a task force for reimagining teaching evaluation, right? There's a lot of intersections among other initiatives that my supervisor is working on, like looking at workload equity Mm -hmm. and thinking about, you know, the work that Carrie Ann O'Meara has done and how um, service is often um, unequally distributed and also things like COVID impact, right? Like women have been differentially impacted by COVID. Mm-hmm. And how can we make these broader institutional changes that support faculty in a, a variety of, of areas of their work life, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, my, my main focus is teaching and learning. But I really feel a lot of... Um, I feel like I'm really making a difference when I'm involved in the broader campus initiatives. And I was able to do that at Adams State at a small school because part of what my teaching and learning center or our teaching and learning center there did was facilitate the faculty development piece Mm -hmm. of a campus-wide curriculum renovation. Mm -hmm. So you can't really engage in a lot of these campus-wide initiatives without a faculty support piece. Mm -hmm. There has to be some education, some coaching, some mentoring, all of that sort of stuff. And it's tied into everything. Mm -hmm. What um, I wrote a piece that hopefully is (laughs) going to be published at some point about how a teaching and learning center is so critical for all these points of the faculty life cycle Uh for the the selection process, right? There's a lot of bias in hiring for the onboarding process, especially when we're talking about women faculty and faculty of color for Mm -hmm. the, how do we support you throughout the academic year and all of the things that you have to do through that arc to the larger evaluation? Do we value teaching? Is it is that apparent in our evaluation process? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think a teaching and learning and center can be a really powerful advocate for the broader campus changes. And I think some of the ways to get involved in that as a faculty member is through service, through very intentional participation in service at mm-hmm. your institution, which I also understand that at larger institutions may be harder to do. Yeah. I was a senator and I would roll my eyes about being a senator because it was my turn again. Mm-hmm. But in some departments, that may be a very, um, that might be a plum role that not mm-hmm. everybody gets to, gets to be involved in. But 
one of the concrete things that I would say is look for leadership opportunities Mm -hmm. at your university that are going to um, result in some transferable skills. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's a great piece of advice. And I think that um, as you were talking, what kept coming to my mind was that uh, many of us who've gone into this role have dabbled in those leadership roles in our department or at the college previously prior to going into a teaching center and mm-hmm. got to see the bigger picture of higher education, yes. which you, as a said, Senate director, you can't help but see. And you see right. as a Senate director that other that faculty, traditional faculty often don't see like budgets and yes. decision-making pro- policies and things like that, that if you get these leadership roles, you get glimpses and you begin to see right. a little bit behind the curtain. Um, exactly. And I think that that's really, it's a really powerful message for people who might want to go into this to do, because you said it before, and I, I, I wanted to follow up on this, but you're on a roll about um, uh, working 12 months. For most of us as faculty, we didn't work eight to four all summer right. every day. Right. But the summer was a time to get things done. And we worked in a way that, that made sense for us and for our families. Right. I, I tended to go, this is embarrassing. I tended to go in three days a week in the summer instead of five days a week. Right. The faculty member, and just for four hours, but it was a time for me to do some writing. That's when exactly. I did the writing. And, and it, it worked for me. And as a Senate director, it wasn't that much of a difference once I became a Senate director. Um, and I think for many of us, that's kind of the way our, our work ethic is anyway. Mm-hmm. But I think mm-hmm. that as people begin to look at it, you want to see what else, because there are some surprising things about moving into administration. And so you right. have to sort of weigh that out. So I think that's, that's terrific right. advice. And I think, um, you know, the, I, I, you roll your eyes at faculty Senate. I have been in enough institutions to see faculty Senate to be in some cases really useful in some cases, kangaroo courtish and, yes. and, and, and bizarre um, yes. and power. <laughs> um, but I think you have to know the, the, the culture of your institution right. Right. And, and, and all that. So I think that's great. So, um, uh, thanks, Leslie. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate having a conversation with you. I think this is all really helpful information. And uh, um, it was great talking to you. You too, Chris. So much fun to spend some time with you this morning. Yeah, thanks.